offline or not. Yes, our next speaker is ready. No, for, there was no, no, there was 20 minutes. Okay. Hello. Um, the next talk is going to be about one shot Fiat Shamir based NISIX of composite residuosity and logarithmic size ring signatures in the standard model. So, this is a joint work uh, by Benoit Libert. Con Guyen, Thomas Peters, and Modi Jung. Thomas Peters will give the talk. Thomas, anytime. Thank you for the introduction. So do you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So yes, this presentation is about non-interactive zero-knowledge arguments and more precisely to see how we can build concretely efficient um, arguments based on composite residuosity problem. And as an application, we show how we can get a really short ring signature in the standard model and this without relying on pairings. So for those who are not familiar with um, the concept of ring signature, let me uh, give a brief recap of what it is. So we have a signer uh, on the left. So we have Bob, we use uh, the secret key SKB to sign any message, but at the signing time, he also embed in the signature a ring of uh, other verification key uh, that come from other users. And why it does that? Because now anyone can check the validity of the signature as usual, but you can only learn that someone in the ring performed the signature, but without knowing exactly who does, who did it. So we have a kind of a anonymity property there. So as far as the correctness is concerned, it's, it means that as long as you have a verification key VK in the ring, and you are using the associated secret key, you can sign any message and any ring, and the signature will be deemed valid as long as you use the same uh, ring R to make the check. So ring signature found an uh, application in the whistleblowing context and cryptocurrencies, and I will give, on, give additional words only for the whistleblowing case. So now we can simply think of Bob being a journalist that want to disclose some document that he received and he want to authenticate the document uh, based on his reputation in order that anybody can believe in the document in the sense that it will not be considered as a fake news. But uh, while uh, other people might be upset by this disclosure, uh, Bob want to hide his identity between a crowd of other users and use a ring signature with other uh, the verification key of other journalists with good reputation as well. Uh, so yeah, that's the idea. I think it's, it, it's clear why we need the anonymity property, but in ring signature, the anonymity property that we target is really strong, meaning that the adversary should remain unable to identify who is the actual signer, even if it knows all the signature, all the secret keys uh, that are involved uh, in the ring. In the paper, we achieve that in a statical stance. And even if the adversary is able to inject verification key that are malformed, so that are not the output of the key generation function. As for the unforgeability, we only reach it uh, from a, a computational assumption, of course. And it simply tells that you keep the usual unforgeability as long as the adversary uh, did not corrupt user that are in the ring. But of course, he can corrupt many other users in the system, and it should not help him uh, producing a, a new valid um, signature. OK, so that was for the application. So low, let's come back at the beginning of the story. So we start with Sigma protocols. And thanks to the, the previous um, presentations, I can go really quick through that. So we have a three-step protocol here. So x is the statement. It's, the prover want to prove that X is in a language to the verifier. And so first the prover here uh, simply commit to uh, some value that we call the first message A here to V. And it is V that uh, send back P with a challenge. And here uh, the challenge space, as you can see, is, is big since it depends on the uh, security parameter in the exponent. And based on that, the prover produce a response. 
So the verifier can check the validity of the transcript. So the, the triple here is called the transcript. And uh, yeah, because the verifier is the, is the guy who picked the challenge, he can be unsure of the validity of the statement. And why? Because if X was not in the language, actually you can rely on the special soundness property. So special soundness property, as we already heard about today, simply means that when you have two transcripts that are valid with the same first message, so you can see that A here and there are the same, then you can easily compute a witness. So that means that if you have two, of course, X is in the language. So that also means that if X is not in the language, once uh, the prover commits to A, there is only one challenge for which it is possible for him to produce uh, a valid response. So in the, sometimes we do not have two special soundness. We have something which is uh, uh, more general than that. And we have, we need more than two um, valid transcripts in order to extract the witness. So here we will need N plus one, but all the time with the same first uh, message A. So that simply means now that if X is not in the language, there exist at most N bad challenges. Uh, and I call bad challenges those challenges for which it is possible to uh, compute a valid response at the end. Okay, so uh, the purpose of the talk is about non-interactive proof. Uh, we know in the random Oracle model how to compile the Sigma protocols into a non-interactive zero knowledge proof and also a proof of knowledge. So here the prover does everything and derives the challenge himself based on a hash function. And as long as the hash function can be modeled as a random oracle, we have a challenge which is uniformly distributed uh, among these large uh, challenge spaces. That means that the probability not to fall on bad challenge is negligible because the challenge space is big. Okay, well, you can also have extraction and, and, and a proof of knowledge if we rewind, but that's not what we are focusing uh, today. But unfortunately, this only works in the RAM and not in the standard model. So people, cryptographers try to find what are the good property of the hash function in order to avoid somehow the bad challenges without relying on ideal as object. So, um, an important uh, advances was proposed with correlation intractable hash function. So this is particular uh, hash function that are related to a relation. So we are now given a relation for which with the hash function, it's hard to find an X such that X with its image uh, are actually in relation. So here we will see how we can use that uh, in our uh, non-interactive uh, protocol if H given X and A, so X the statement and the first uh, the first message of the prover. So you see that as, as your input. If it is hard to find an input for which the challenge here will be the bad challenge, then you are okay. Even if it's not uniform, you just avoid the bad challenge and you have the soundness. But correlation interactable hash function uh, is what's hard to, 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 to build. And uh, yes, many, many cryptographers try to make advances in that direction. And recently in 2019, Kaneti et al. Uh, show how to build collision interactable hash function when the uh, relation is efficiently searchable. And what does that mean? That means that once you are given uh, one of the two elements of the couple here, it is efficient to find the other one. Okay, so that means that if we now want to use everything together, that means that the hash function, even if you know what should be the output of the hash function, the hash function will not fall on that value. Okay, and now if you can compute uh, these bad challenges, uh, for that you need a trapdoor, then you can uh, build uh, an uninteractive proof based on Fiat Shamir and such kind of hash function based on a trapdoor sigma protocol. So the trapdoor sigma protocol is what allows you to find the bad challenges. This is simply what uh, you can see on this slide. So the trapdoor sigma protocol, now you have a CRS and based on that CRS, you have a trapdoor value two. And as long as you have now a, a, a statement, a, a false statement, so an X which is not in the language, and any first prover message then to allow you to find all the end challenges, the bad challenges. So if the underlying uh, protocol has n plus one uh, special soundness. 
We can then simply apply the collision intractable of Kennedy et al, which is based on fully homomorphic encryption and special property of the secret key. But uh, the same year, uh, Peckert and Shenyan also show, oh, is it possible to build such kind of uh, hash function based on LWE solely? Okay, so we can simply say now that's the end of the story because uh, once you are given a Sigma protocol with binary challenge, you can turn it into a trapdoor protocol. Okay, so what's the point now? The point is that with binary challenges, if you want to have uh, a real soundness at the end, um, because here with one half, you, you may find uh, by chance the, the one for which you will be able to produce fake proof. Now you have to repeat the underlying Sigma protocols and you need to make uh, a linear number of repetition in the security parameter if you want to decrease the error soundness probability uh, to make it negligible. Okay, so that means that so far, not only the generic uh, construction, but so far all the instantiation needs for trapdoor protocol needs parallel repetition. So parallel repetition, of course, is something which uh, gives you less efficiency if uh, you can compare it once you have cut and choose technique and then more uh, uh, technique like Schnorr-like protocol. And this is exactly what we want to bring here, such kind of communication improvement. Um, one uh, important thing here to see that it is not for free uh, for in terms of the, the, the trapdoor of the system is that if the underlying Sigma protocol is not only two special soundness, but n plus one special soundness for, for n strictly bigger than one, that means that it, during the parallel repetition, the number of bad challenges will blow up. So that means that repetition anyway will make it hard to, to find, uh, to, to rely on, on such kind of transformation. So the goal uh, of our paper is to show how we can do that in the standard model in one shot, meaning that we can directly have a, a negligible soundness error uh, when in using a large uh, challenge space. Okay, so we here is a, just a, a, an example, a starting example of a, a tra trapdoor protocol. So we start with a basic Sigma protocol. And yeah, here, thanks to uh, the previous uh, presentation, we can see that we have a homomorphism, so I can go through that really quickly. But what kind of homomorphism do we have? We work in the DCR setting. So the DCR setting is uh, the setting where the PIE encryption uh, has been defined. So we have we have a, a RSA modulus, n, which is the pro the product of uh, P and Q, and the language here is the uh, n's power. So you have to prove that an element is an n power of something modulo n square. So based on that, now I think that you can understand the, the basic Sigma protocol. So here there is no trapdoor. You simply pick the randomness. You do exactly what you, you did here. You get the challenge, you get the response, the, verific the verifier can check this equation. This is exactly the one that we had on uh, the slide before. Okay, so now where the trapdoor can come from, um, so, as I said, this is related to the PIE encryption, and actually the language here can be seen as the uh, ciphertext that encrypts zero. So that means that if X is not in the language, actually it encrypts something different. And there is something which is really important here is that actually any element modulo n, n square are the ciphertext, are encryption of something. So there might be the case that actually X is not in a, is not an encryption of something, even if it is in a in a range for which it is indistinguishable to tell if it's an encryption or not. But we do not have that problem, and in that sense, we are the first to provide a trapdoor sigma protocol because uh, basic uh, idea have already been used before. But we are the first uh, to to do it uh, completely. So now D here is simply the decryption of the PI encryption. So P and Q are allow you to decrypt. So if X is not in the language, that means that X encrypts something different than zero modulo N. And uh, even if it is a multiple of P, we do not care. We do not have to avoid uh, that case. Uh, if it is a, a multiple of P, it's not a, a multiple of Q. And then we have this property over the plain text space, modulo Q then, and this value alpha X is not zero modulo Q. That means that we can 
uh, find, we can compute, solve this equation and find the challenge. And if it fits in the, the challenge space, then we, we found the bad challenge, the only one that can exist here. Okay, and so this equation, if you do not see, co simply come from the verification equation that you decrypt. Right, so that's the, the first construction that we give in the paper. And now based on that and other trapdoor sigma protocols, we uh, build a ring signature in the standard model. So here, this is just a, a, a quick recap of the state of the art. So using a CRS, uh, cryptographers manage to uh, produce ring signature that have size, which is sublinear. And, um, and recently, it was possible to make logarithmic size ring signature, but without relying on a CRS. But actually, those two last works are really theoretical. So the hidden constant are really, really huge. You, it, it's just impossible to use that in practice, even if, of course, from a theoretical point of view, uh, this is great advances. So in this paper, we assume that we have a CRS and based on that, we keep the logarithmic size signature, but our goal is to provide concretely short signature in the sense that uh, it is comparable to the one that you can have in the random oracle model. So we prove everything based on the DCR assumption. So decisional composite residuosity problem and the LWE and LWE is only used uh, for the collision and tractable hash function. All the other building blocks that we provide in the paper are proven uh, based on the DCR assumption. Okay, so let me give you some hints of our construction. So it is based on the Groth and Colvice construction, which was given in the random oracle model. And so the idea there is that all the verification key are actually additively homomorphic commitment to zero. So we see uh, in a trapdoor uh, sigma protocol that we can use uh, the commitment, but we need our commitment to be perfectly hiding in order to get a statistical anonymity. So we will need a commitment and not a PIE encryption, but here it is detailed. And so the idea there uh, is to perform a ring signature by making a signature of knowledge. Um, what does that mean? That means that you just incorporate the message that you want to sign in the hash function, um, which is modeled as a random oracle in that work. And uh, you prove that actually among all the, the, the commitment in the ring that are the verification key, you can open one and they provide a logarithmic size proof for that. Okay, how oh, can we turn that in the standard model now? So that's our main question because we need trapdoor, trapdoor sigma protocol. And as we see, we cannot rely on the discrete log setting because we do not have uh, a way to, uh, extra, to, to find the bad challenges in that case, or except if we repeat, but if we repeat, we have an exponential number of bad challenges. So we are stuck. So we, we rely on the trapdoor sigma protocol that I uh, just presented you a few slides ago. Great, so what does that mean? So that means that now uh, each uh, verification key are commitment to zero in the DCR setting. Uh, we turn the Sigma protocol into a trapdoor Sigma protocol showing that one out of our commitments opens to zero. And in order to compute the bad challenge, we actually have to solve a polynomial equation of degree small r and small r is the logarithm of big R. And you can do that with a, a big challenge uh, space. Okay, but of course we have many other difficulties that we have to uh, circumvent in order to have our final construction. So the problem is that how can we approve the unforgeability in the standard model result relying on the random oracle? Because in the random oracle, by using the forking lemma, you can rewind the adversary and then extract a witness. And as long as you have a witness, you, you, you of course have uh, the, the soundness and you have, uh, you know that uh, uh, it's not possible to, it, it's not feasible to, to have a, 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 a true, a valid uh, signature or valid proof. So the idea is that we do not need to prove knowledge. We simply need to argue membership. So we rely on unbounded simulations on arguments and we provide in the paper some a construction in the DCR uh, setting based on lossy uh, encryption. And so our idea in the proof is to force the adversary to make a forgery 
related to a commitment that will no more be a commitment to zero and then uh, break the, 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 the simulation soundness. Right, but that's not enough because, oh no, do we define uh, that the adversary wins? So we force in the, we want to force in the security game that the, the adversary actually uh, is able, if the adversary is able to produce a forgery, that means that it's actually able to produce an opening of a verification key. So that means that we want to rely somehow on the soundness property inside the protocol. And we want to know which one of the verification key in the ring is actually attacking, if you want. So that means that um, now in the security proof, we will simply guess which uh, position uh, will be um, the, the one of the verification key that the adversary try to, to break in some sense. And then we will turn it into, uh, in the next step in the proof, turn it into a commitment to one. But uh, that's not enough. I'm just checking the time. Uh, that's not enough because um, we want to prove the security in the standard model, but without erasure. So that means that if you remember, the adversary can corrupt user in the unforgeability game. And once he corrupts a user, we have to give to the adversary all the coin, the random coin that we use to produce a previous signature that it asks. So now the idea is simply not to simulate uh, the, the, the signature and the proof, but simply to guess which, uh, which identity will never be corrupted and the one that for which the adversary tried to produce a forgery. It looks simple here, but actually uh, in order to be sure that we have a probability one out of R to, to make a good guess, uh, we still need to have uh, information theoretical argument there. So that means that we need something which is uh, sufficient, which is perfectly hiding, but at the same time, we also need to extract the position. So we have some conflicting properties uh, that need to work together. So we have to, to solve that, we had to, to build sometimes extractable, perfectly hiding commitment in the DCR setting. Okay, and we are already done. Uh, to show the, the security of the scheme. So there is one problem left now is that we want to switch uh, at some point between a commitment to zero and a commitment to one. So that means that for that, we have to rely on the DCR assumption, of course, but at the same time, we need to extract uh, the, the bit, the position, the bit string here of the position of the, the verification key in the ring in the forgery. But for that, we need a membership trapdoor related to the DCR setting, which is uh, of course related to the factorization of the module. That means that if we want to extract and at the same time being able to make an indistinguishable transition there, we have to work with distinct groups and then distinct moduli, which is of course make uh, life uh, harder. And uh, the problem that uh, comes from the working with two distinct uh, groups is because in the way the, the, the ring signature of uh, uh, Groth and Colvas works, actually the answer of the, the, the underlying answer in the, in the signature related to the bits, the position of the verification key are actually used to select uh, the verification key that it is used during the signature process. So that means that these Z, Z, J have to be exponent uh, of the commitment. And so now we go into trouble because the two groups, the, there is no homomorphism between the two groups. And so in order to uh, avoid problem, we had to ensure that the uh, Z, J there, there is no implicit reduction in it because otherwise we, we lose the, the information that we want to carry over the commitment. So, this is what we, we solve also to, to construct a ring signature. And so somehow the proof related to the position must work over the integers. So yes, that's it for the unforgeability. There are additional difficulty for proving anonymity, but I do not have the time uh, to, to go on that. But to summarize what we have, uh, we propose the first one-shot trapdoor sigma protocol. So in a single shot, we have a negligible soundness error. We do not have to make repetition. Uh, and so we no more have to rely on something like cut and choose technique in terms of uh, 
comparable efficiency if you want. And also our ring signature is concretely efficient in the sense that now the ring signature uh, has simply keys that is a single commitment modulo n square and the secret key are the random coin of the commitment. So this is really short. There is nothing hidden there. And the size of the signature is actually only uh, thrice uh, the one that you get in the random oracle model. So to, to summarize, that means that we uh, affirmatively answer the question whether it is possible to build concretely short privacy preserving signature in the standard model without pairings. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions from the audience? We have time. Yeah, would you like to step here to the microphone? Thanks for the talk. Um, maybe you already mentioned it and I didn't hear, but um, were you able to show adaptive soundness for your construction or only non-adaptive soundness? Uh, so in the, uh, actually, in the ring signature, um, uh, in the, it is adaptive in the ring in the ring signature anyway, since uh, yeah, it depends of uh, what the adversary already asked. Um, uh, just how can I explain? So yes, I think yeah, the soundness is adaptive here, but I do not remember how. Okay. I'm sorry, Thanks. I do not remember. Well, I mean, we, we can discuss more uh, offline. Maybe I will yeah, send sure. you an email. Thanks. Are there more questions? Then maybe I have one. Uh, could you please go back to your difficulty two? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just curious about um, so here you rely on argue membership instead of knowledge and use loss encryption. I'm just curious about how novel these techniques are, to which extent use specific features that were unique to your setting, and so on and so forth. I'm just curious about okay. the approach. Yeah. Yeah. So here, the fact that you want to use a uh, simulation soundness argument, of course, here it's not new. Uh, it's just that we uh, have to uh, provide all the ingredients that are needed. And for the LSE encryption, actually, for the, in the this year uh, setting, uh, we had to adapt existing techniques, but uh, the building block in itself in the this year setting, uh, we have to propose one that did not exist. But of course, relying on simulation soundness here to make uh, in, the, in the construction is of course something that it is not, uh, that is not new and construction, uh, Constructing unbounded simulation sonar's argument from OC encryption is also something which is not new. So here it's just for the purpose of the construction. Okay, thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. And yeah, that was our last talk of this session. So thank you. <laughs>